Track 8, Within You and Without You. This was the only track on the album written by George Harrison, and the only track that featured none of the other Beatles except for George Harrison. Written while at the house of musician and artist Klaus Vormann, Harrison's inspiration for the song came from a conversation they had shared over dinner regarding the metaphysical space that prevents individuals from recognizing the natural forces uniting the world, which is why the song opens with the words, We were talking about the space between us all. Lyrically, it combines both Eastern and Western religious ideas. The opening line of the song is taken from Hindu teaching. In order for us to draw closer and give up on the space between us all, we need to give up on the illusion of ego and realize that we are essentially all one. And yet later in the song, the line about gaining the world but losing your soul is taken from a quote by Jesus in the Gospels. It's interesting to point out how in an unintentional bit of coincidental similarity uh, to the song's lyrical themes that Within You and Without You is also performed by both Eastern and Western musicians. In the book A Hard Day's Right, George Martin states that organizing the Indian musicians who don't read music was easy, but that creating a score for the Western musicians so that they could sound like the Indian musicians was very difficult. He goes on to compare how one Indian musician would be doing all kinds of swoops out of sheer improvisation and familiarity with his instrument, and how he would then have to find a way to score this for Western classical musicians, who could only play what you put on the printed page for them to read. This would prove very challenging when it came time to record A Day in the Life, but more on that later. In many ways, indie musicians make a much better match for rock musicians, since rock musicians rarely ever read music and also rely a good deal on improvisation as well. Written in the key of C, the song is composed around one chord, or should I say around a fifth chord interval in the key of C. A fifth interval drones throughout while the vocal and instrumental melodies dance around the sustained interval. If you look at the published sheet music, for Within You and Without You, you will see absolutely no chords written. In the bass clef, you will just see a C bass in octaves, either droning or just kind of moving up and down. While the melody moves around that, not even a C chord is written, probably because it's all based, I think, on fifths, a lot of Indian music is sometimes. Let's uh, play it and check it out. It feels like chords are changing, but they're not, ever. Within You and Without You is the only song written by George Harrison on the Sgt. Pepper album. And in my opinion, alongside of A Day in the Life, it is one of the most epic songs on the album. Part of it is the lyrical themes that he chooses to explore in this song, Another portion of it, though, I have to give credit to George Martin's stellar production on this particular track. Pay particular note to the pizzicato strings that fade in and out during the song's rather epic instrumental break.
For many years listening to this album, I always wondered about the burst of laughter at the end of the song. It turns out that George Harrison just wanted to add a bit of levity or lightness to the end of the song after being very serious for over five minutes. It was probably not intentional, but it ends up working quite well as a segue to the next track. Track 9, When I'm 64. When I get older, losing my hair Many years from now Will you still be sending me a valentine? You know, my mother really likes this song. But I'll get back to that in a moment. The song is credited to Lennon and McCartney, but of course history has shown that the song was written by McCartney when he was 16. Lennon has stated in interviews that the Beatles would perform it whenever their amplifiers broke down or the electricity went off during the early Cavern Club days. Apparently there was an acoustic piano in the club to facilitate this. There has also been some reported accounts that Lennon and McCartney added the Grandchildren on Your Knee, Vera, Chuck, and Dave section before recording it for Sgt. Pepper. For this track, Paul McCartney performed the lead and backing vocals, bass, guitar, and piano. John performed backing vocals and, interestingly enough, lead guitar. George played guitar and supplied backing vocals, and Ringo, of course, plays drums and tubular bells. Session players Robert Burns, Henry McKenzie, and Frank Reedy were brought in to perform the clarinet trio, which featured two B-flat clarinets and one bass clarinet, all of which was arranged and scored by producer George Martin. By the way, my apologies in advance if I have mispronounced any of the names of any of the session musicians who played on this track. I'm not worried about it, though, because I know the internet will be happy to correct me if I do make any mispronunciations. If you listen to the bonus disc on the 2017 deluxe edition of the album, you will get an early take two version of the song, which features just drums, bass, piano, lead vocals, and some of the guitar on the breakdowns. I am guessing that McCartney probably performed the bass and vocals with Ringo on drums first, and then added in the piano as an overdub. What's nice about this early take is that you get a rare opportunity to really hear some of Ringo's excellent, but oftentimes overlooked and understated cymbal work. And Giles Martin also brings this out on the 2017 remix. This sparse take two version also helps to illustrate just how much the clarinets and tubular bells and the backing vocals do to elevate this song. At about the 37 second mark, the song transitions from Tin Pan Alley to a kind of light classical music. So we come out of that last, when I'm 64, and then we have this surprisingly classical sounding little interlude here. Let me play this for you. that all changes when we hit that C. Now getting back to my mother. My parents grew up in a different musical era. The big band era of Tommy Dorsey and Glenn Miller was their era. And there was this huge generational divide when it came to music between myself and my parents. But when my mother first heard me listening to When I'm 64, on the record player in my bedroom, she came in and commented, Oh, I remember this song. They used to play this song back in the 40s. This would have been in the 70s, and I told her that this song was recorded by the Beatles in the late 60s. She responded, Yes, but this is an old song from the 40s, and the Beatles must have re-recorded it. I showed her the album sleeve and showed her that the writing of the song was credited to Lennon and McCartney. She shook her head and said, No, I remember this song from the 40s. It's a really good song. I have never been able to find an earlier version of When I'm 64 by anyone other than the Beatles. 
All I can say is that Paul McCartney wrote a song so convincingly of another period that my mother believed it to be part of her memories. And it's amazing that he wrote this song at the age of 16. Yes, he may have gotten a little help from his friends fleshing it out for this album, but the major musical and lyrical themes of the song were created by a 16-year-old. Again, amazing. Track 10, Lovely Rita. Okay, so you all know that Paul McCartney wrote the song about a real female traffic warden. It's always been kind of assumed that the ticket was issued to Paul personally. But in the accompanying book to the deluxe 50th anniversary edition for Sgt. Pepper, it's revealed that the title of the song came about when a visiting American friend remarked to Paul McCartney that he hadn't realized that the UK had meter maids until he noticed one issuing a ticket. The term meter maid was an American term, and one that Sir McCartney had not heard before. But hearing it was obviously enough to make the light bulb go off in his head and make him think to himself, Aha! There's a song in that. Unlike the previous four tracks on side two of Sgt. Pepper, which required outside musicians to complete their respective visions, Lovely Rita features the Fab Four handling pretty much all of the instrumentation, although producer George Martin does perform the very lively piano solo during the instrumental section. Also, Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison perform the comb and paper kazoo notes that you hear after the line, made her look a little like a military man. Yes, that section is being performed with comb and paper. Now, the key that the song was actually played in versus the key you hear it in are two different things because after the basic tracks were laid down, the tape speeds were slightly modified here and there as more tracks were added. You can find the low down nitty gritty info on this aspect of the recordings within the pages of the hardcover book for the 50th anniversary edition. However, the standard published sheet music has the song written in E major. Once again, the Beatles defy convention and just go with what feels right by not starting on the root chord. The song starts on a repeating B A E B descending chord structure that helps to support a dreamlike atmosphere on the song's opening. But the verse opens on its root chord of E, becoming more musically straightforward in order to better support the song's lyrical narrative. After the last verse, the song returns to its dreamlike opening for two cycles and then abruptly jumps into A minor. Lovely Rita is written in the key of E major. In the key of E major, F, G, C, and D are played as sharps. So we are coming out of the last section of the song where we sing the chorus. Lovely Rita, meet a maid. Lovely Rita, meet a maid. No sooner does that measure end when suddenly we have an A on the bass and we're playing thirds. And even though it's not written as such, it sure sounds like A minor. I sometimes think that the Beatles' lack of music theory education and their desire to not copy themselves often led to unintentionally interesting musical choices, like the sudden key change ending to Lovely Rita Illustrates. At this point, I do have to pause and cut off at the pass what I know will be some internet music theory trolls. I am sure that there are more than just a few of you out there who are just chomping at the bit to correct me and inform me that the published sheet music has the entire song in the key of E major, uh, they've simply just flatted or turned all the notes that should be sharped into naturals. I am well aware of this, and you know what? 
it doesn't really make a difference. They could have just as easily saved themselves some ink from having to flat all those sharp notes and put it in the key of A minor for its closing. Either way, it accomplishes the same thing. For all intents and purposes, the ending of the song is in A minor. It is a key change, even if it's not written that way. Internet Music Theory Trolls Dismissed This sudden switch to A minor creates an unexpected dark musical ending to what is otherwise a very cheery and upbeat song. All the vocal moaning and heavy breathing that accompanies this section add to the effect and always made me think that a lot more happened between Rita and her sisters and the song's main protagonist than we are led to believe. I guess I'm not the only one who thinks this because I can remember a pre-internet interview where Paul was asked this question. He denied that there was any sexual connotation to any of it, stating that the song's lyric explicitly states, took her home, I nearly made it, sitting on the sofa with a sister or two, meaning that Rita's sisters made sure that no funny business went on. But for me, the music will always tell me otherwise. Hey everybody, this is TJR. If you like this video, please click like, but also click subscribe, and be sure to click the bell icon for notifications so you can know when I make and release new videos. Thanks everybody for watching. Stay tuned for part four.